All right, I guess I'll uh, go over the solution now. So these are sort of the values um, on my VM uh, that I had as far as the addresses for each of these uh, methods are concerned. So uh, for me, UN48 was located at uh, this address, and system was located at this address. And I actually passed uh, the slash bin slash sh string uh, uh, through, through the uh, input string. And uh, that was also located uh, on the stack in uh, the 70 space. Um, so if you reference your stack diagram, uh, I, I'll actually walk through sort of why that stack diagram is the way it is. So, here. So, first of all, I guess kind of use the Perl script to output the solution. So, uh, buffer actually, if you notice in uh, in the bOverflow.c source file, uh, it's an it's a car array of uh, five bytes. But uh, since it has to do um, four byte alignment. It'll actually allocate two spaces on the slot, right? So it becomes eight, uh, and so you get these essentially two uh, four byte spaces on the stack uh, for a buffer, um, and then followed by that, uh, we have to ha have an additional value for the Kali saved register, which is R11. So if you disassemble stage one and GDB, you will see that. Uh, uh, both R R11 and the link register are getting pushed onto the stack, and so the R11 comes right after the buff uh, buffer, um, and then following that, we need uh, as part of the stack diagram, we need the link register, uh, and in this case, since my ERAN48, uh, the the specific instruction for loading into R uh, R1 and R0 was located at uh, 76 F2. 8E56. Uh, I have to actually add one. And so, uh, and I have to also write it in little endian format. So you kind of have to reverse the byte order for the address here. So you would put uh, 578E F276. And then you concatenate that with uh, the address of your string, uh, which in my case was. Uh, this is So for me, the string was located at uh, 7 e f f f 6 e 8 And so I'll have that. And then followed by that, we essentially have R1, uh, which is actually not used by the system syscall. It only expects one argument in R0, so we can put some junk in there. Uh, and also because ERAN48, that line, does a load register double. So you have to have two values there, so it can load those two values into R0, R1, uh, because they're uh, also updating the stack pointer there. Uh, and you'll also see uh, in ERAN48, there's a stack pointer minus 12, uh, which means it's moving three four-byte spaces on the stack, and which is why you sort of need to include uh, junk values there. So the first junk value is the R1 value, uh, the second one is uh, any junk value that you want, like IJKL in my case. Um, and followed by that, uh, we actually need the system address. So the address for the system call, uh, system function is actually for me was located at 76F2D768. So you have to add one here again. So wherever there's a branch with link occurring, uh, where it takes the address from the link register and puts it into the PC, uh, you have to add one uh, as the least significant bit. So that's actually a, a 6, 9 there. So it's sort of a 6, 8, I just added one. And again, this address has to be in little Indian format. 
Uh, and once you do, uh, once you have the system syscall, then I actually put the um, shell string um, and pass that through onto the stack. And so once I have this, So once I have that, I can uh, go into GDB buffer overflow, and we'll actually step through and see what's happening. Um, so I usually put a breakpoint on state one, and I'm also going to put a breakpoint at the last instruction there, just so we see that uh, branch with length occurring. So now if I say run, uh, so first I hit the stage one code. Um, as you can see, it's already uh, advanced itself. Um, then I hit continue. So right now I'm at the last instruction in stage one. And uh, if you actually go to examine the stack, uh, you can actually see uh, I did three, three ABCDs. Um, so you can see uh, that's ASCII uh, encoding. So it's hex 41, 42, 43, 44. And it occurs three times on the stack. Uh, and then I have my. <laughs> I had fed the value in Little Indian, and so you can see it's actually GDB shows us the uh, uh, Big Indian format when you do memory, examine memory. So that's why you're seeing it as the straight up address uh, 76. So this is our address for ERAN 48. And we can actually disassemble ERAN 48 to see that address, right? So you have 76F28D57. And that's going to be, uh, it's actually 5.6, so it's, it's going to land us right here. So when I do step I, so right now I'm in ERAN 48. So now we can actually uh, step I and then look at what's in R0 and what's in R1. So R0 should have the address of our string. And one way to verify that is you just say examine slash string dollar uh, R0. So apparently my string is not there. So my address is off for the string now. So I'm going to have to redo my string. But essentially, uh, all you're doing here is uh, once you have the string address, you should be able to actually um, load the address of the string into R0. And then you'll get the junk value, which in my case, I use like EFGH. Uh, and then I add another jump value because the stack pointer is being decremented by three stack spaces instead of just two. So you have, you'll have R0, which is the address of your string, uh, R1, and then one more value. So I used uh, EFGH, IJKL as the jump values so that the stack pointer would adjust itself 
Following that, uh, we're going to have the address of system, and the system actually gets loaded into PC, uh, and R0 is going to have the address of our slash bin slash sh string, uh, and you're going to pop a shell. In my case, it's not going to work because uh, the slash bin slash sh uh, is not in the correct location on the stack. So. So now I actually, I'm using Dave's address from the memory, so it seems to be pretty static as compared to the stack. Yeah. Uh, and so now if I actually continue, uh, I get a shell, so I can do an I. So it'll start running with the same privileges as whatever this process was running in. So, um, Back to GDB. So I haven't been able to make this uh, work without GDB yet. So the address addresses change uh, if you're not using GDB. The only thing I know that GDB uh, does is turn off randomization. Um, but yeah, so if you have any suggestions, let me know. Okay, yeah, works. All right. So the issue was that the uh, stack kept moving. No, so uh, Dave actually found out the, a location in memory where the same slash bin slash sh is, but it's, uh, it's not a stack so address. Yeah. So that's the trick. Nice. Thanks, Dave. So, does uh, did everybody get that? Close. Close. <laughs> All right. Well, close enough. So. The next stage I would have liked to do is uh, format string, but uh, I didn't actually have a chance to do that. So now that you all are lead actors, right, and uh, we know how to do assembly. Uh, we know how to write uh, C code. Um, do we really know what happens uh, when we compile our C code, right? There are certain things that we assume um, happen for us, right? Um, so th there are certain optimizations that are built into GCC, and this is cross platform. Um, and so I'd like to say this, uh, however, with great compilers comes great responsibility um, because you have to know sort of what code is being generated uh, on the assembly side, um, especially on embedded <laughs> systems because embedded systems are used in a lot of safety applications, uh, a lot of very uh, critical applications. So uh, it's very important to uh, actually <coughs> understand how the C code gets compiled down into assembly. So with that, um, here's an example from uh, Professor Dave Alhauron's uh, book, Computer Systems. So uh, usually the compiler knows best, but uh, in this case, can you guys tell me what's wrong? So actually, let me start sharing.
Maybe you know what's wrong with this piece of code. So are function 1 and function 2 the same? So would you get the same value in A from both function 1 and 2? Exactly. So um, if you were to pass in the same pointer right, for both A and B in uh, function 1 and function 2, uh, function 1 would possibly give you uh, four times the value of uh, the val value that was passed in to both A and B, uh, but function 2 would give you three times the value, right? So they're clearly different. So when the compiler compiles uh, this sort of C code, right, an ARM, it would rather use the inline barrel shifter, right, and do it this way, but uh, if you were to use just plain C and write the code yourself, if this were to get optimized in this uh, way, then you would have different results. Um, and so, if you, if you guys are more interested in more evil C, uh, check out this link. Uh, entertaining. So, some of the optimizations that GCC does for you is uh, things like dead code removal. Um, it's essentially code that never gets run. Uh, and any of the control flows uh, never reaches that piece of code. And so uh, GCC is pretty good about uh, removing such code. So uh, one way to help the compiler decide that is to use like if defs. So if you use uh, if defs, right, uh, it's pretty easy for the compiler to check the variable state and see if it's ever going to get run and then remove that piece of code if that define never is uh, set. And another one is induction variables and strength reduction. Uh, induction variables are variables that always increment in fixed amounts or increment or decrement in fixed amounts inside of your code. Um, and generally, uh, strength reduction means that instead of uh, incrementing, decrementing by multiplying, uh, you use a weaker function like uh, addition, right? And additions can be a little bit more optimal than uh, multiplication, for example. It takes less cycles. So. Um, the, another one is called uh, loop unrolling. So loop unrolling, I'll go over an example later, uh, is where you actually, instead of running a for loop and running the same piece of code, uh, it's and writing just a short piece of code, loop unrolling actually increases the code size. But what you do is uh, you take the number of times you loop and divide it by an integer. But you repeat that same piece of code that many t a number of times. And uh, it actually helps the, uh, uh, it actually reduces the number of branches. So we'll look at that example a little bit later. Uh, another one is function inlining. So inline functions, if you're, if you're probably already familiar with that, is uh, it replaces uh, whatever function call you make in the code with the actual contents of the function in line with the rest of the code. So this uh, reduces the number of branches because it doesn't have to branch to the function and then come back. Uh, and it helps the branch predictor sort of. So, um, so here are some ARM specific optimizations. Uh, you've already seen the barrel shift. Um, it's more optimal to use the inline barrel shifter to operate on uh, registers than to uh, actually do multiplication. So another one is use of conditional execution. I would mentioned this before, where if you use the conditional mnemonics uh, on the instructions, uh, it also reduces code size and the number of execution cycles. Um, it's actually not um, execution cycles. What I meant to say there was uh, it uh, increases your throughput, because uh, the ARM processor can optimize uh, for the pipeline, essentially. Another one is uh, countdown loops. And uh, instead of uh, doing uh, from i equals 0 to uh, i is less than n, where n is some big number, uh, you do i equals to n and then decrement down to 0. And that's because uh, when the loop is uh, translated into assembly, you'll instead of getting an add, compare, and branch, you actually, uh, you actually get a conditional branch along with the subtract instruction. Uh, and the conditional branches we all know above from above 
uh, tends to uh, improve your branch prediction and uh, and you're, it's more optimal that way. So, and another uh, thing is, since ARM is 32 bits, it's always uh, good to use 32 bit data types uh, as compared to uh, non multiples of 32 because misaligned memory accesses can be very costly. Another one to avoid is divisions. Um, as we all know, the uh, Cortex A profile doesn't have any integer division operation. Uh, and so it's uh, best to avoid division as much as possible. Uh, it's a very expensive software based operation. And then uh, register accesses are always more efficient than memory accesses. Uh, registers are implemented as uh, flip flops on the hardware. So uh, it has the ARM processor can directly access these values as opposed to actually going asking the memory <coughs> controller to go fetch something. <coughs> Um, and so as part of this, you want to also avoid register spilling. Register spilling is essentially when you have a function with like a million parameters. Uh, and what happens is it will put the first four parameters uh, into R0 through R3, but the remainder of the parameters actually end up going on the stack, which is in memory. So uh, you want to use registers as much as possible. So um, it'll be faster for access as opposed to going to the memory controller and asking the memory controller to go access the stack. Uh, usually you can also um, improve the cache lat latency by um, actually giving those hit instructions I told you about earlier, uh, where it's actually able to take consecutive memory accesses and uh, update its cache, and then you just have to go to the cache as opposed to going to the actual memory. Um, and then there's also use of uh, pure functions, uh, which don't have any side effects. So pure functions basically don't rely uh, on. Uh, so whatever value you pass in is the only value that's needed for the function to uh, do its work. It doesn't rely on any outside global resources and things like that. Um, so that's what I meant by side effects. So here's an example of countdown loops. So as you can see on the left-hand side, um, I have a for, for loop from 0 to 64, and it's incrementing. So it generates add, compare, and then uh, you have a BCC L1 at the bottom. But uh, on the other one, you have 4 I equals 63 down to 0. It just generates subs and then BGE. So, that's an example for countdown loops, 32-bit uh, data types. The problem here is uh, you can see that T3 uses a car variable versus T4, which uses an int. Uh, the difference here is a car. The uh, GCC will actually put in a check to make sure it's between a range of 0 and 255 because it's a car, and uh, versus using an int where it doesn't have to do that check. So as you can see here, it's doing an and R1 with uh, it's doing and R1 with FF just to make sure it's within two uh, within 255. Um, so, any questions so far? So another one is uh, function calls. So this is uh, an example of the pure function that I was talking about. So here, test, uh, you can either say return square of x times x plus square, uh, square of x times x. But that will essentially result in two, uh, two calls to square, so hence two branches. Uh, whereas if you just say 2 times square of x times x, you have to make sure there aren't any side effects where you, know, you have um, synchronization issues between the two. If uh, square were to depend on a global variable for something, uh, then the executions of this square, the first square, uh, would be different from the execution of the second square, and that would uh, result in a side effect, what's called a side effect. So you, uh, as long as the function doesn't have a side effect and it's a pure function, you can just uh, optimize it by calling two times square of x times x. So
So uh, another one is uh, code alignment. So especially struts are very well known to cause misalignment issues. So um, if you arranged your variables in the struct accordingly, it will end up using uh, less number of bytes. So uh, you end up with a more efficient struct. And I think this is true for not only ARM, but it's also x86. But um, you could use a packed keyword to remove the padding. Uh, but that's dangerous because what PAC does is it actually removes the padding no matter what order it's in. Uh, so it'll actually use just one byte and that ends up in uh, misaligned memory accesses, right? So in order to access car A in the first struct, uh, it ends up actually doing a misaligned access to uh, access, for example, car C uh, versus in the second one. So it's always better to uh, not use the PAC keyword but uh, make the struct optimal ourselves manually. Does that make sense? All right. So I'll give you a while. Yeah, I'll give you some time to read this one. So I know Charles had a beef with this. <laughs> There are any programmers with skills using butterflies, let me know. There actually now is a, uh, what is it, Com control X meta key C meta butterfly in Emacs implemented, <laughs> so, which flips a bit. <laughs> so. All right, so now we get to the section on writing some <coughs> inline assembly using butterflies or whatever your favorite editor is. Um, so generally, uh, a lot of the inline assembly follows this format. Um, this is especially, I think Benjamin uh, from the remote site had asked about uh, doing assembly for the iPhone. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not too familiar with uh, the iPhone, but uh, iPhone development. But from what I've heard, a lot of them recommend using inline assembly uh, in line with the Objective-C code, um, which is possible. And I know that it follows a similar format. Uh, the only thing I saw was on Stack Overflow. They say that all assembly functions uh, need to start off with an underscore. Uh, but I haven't tried that myself. But uh, you can actually use this format for uh, your ARM assembly. So, so generally, the uh, ASM directive uh, is in your code. You just write ASM followed by the uh, instruction that you want. But instead of using registers, you put your own variable names. Um, and so for example, move uh, destination, which is result, and value, which is the operand, uh, which is right rotated by uh, one bit. And so what this does is, uh, this, this is actually the code that gets run, but it will assign the next available register to these variables. Um, and the assembler does that for us. And so that's why you kind of use these variable names instead. And then you actually give the output operand list. In this case, we want to read back the, uh, the register that gets assigned to result, because uh, we want to get that um, value from result in our C code. And then that's followed by a colon and the input operand list, in, which case, in this case it's value. We're passing in um, value. And the, the R here, equals R, is referred to as a constraint. Uh, equals is a modifier. Uh, I'll refer to modifiers a little bit later. And finally, the clobber list is a, uh, it's apparently optional, uh, I think, but don't quote me on that. Uh, the clobber list is essentially the list of registers that you know are going to be uh, used up uh, and you don't want to touch them essentially using this code. So. It'll try, the assembler will try and find other registers to um, use in its place, essentially. So this one, um, 
we're passing, the way you pass the values into these uh, registers, so for example, value is an input operand, um, and that's represented by x. Uh, and x is actually an integer that can be defined in your C code. Uh, and y is the output, and that's, that can be another integer. Uh, so you can just say int x, int y, and then after you run this ASM command, your y will have the uh, result from x, but you're using assembly to copy the value from x into y instead of directly using x assign or y assign x. So this is just a simplistic example that I want to use. So if you remember, I mentioned constraints. So here, uh, we're representing our variables uh, in place of registers. But let's say you want to use, uh, instead of registers, uh, there are different kinds of registers you can use. So if the ARM board came with a um, vector flowing point unit, VFU, uh, and you wanted to do vector flowing point operations, uh, instead of using the core registers, you wanted to specify the flowing point registers, which are available on that piece of hardware, you would use the F instead of the R here, uh, equals F. And similarly, so these are all the available um, constraints for use in inline assembly. So generally, though, you'll, you'll be using R. So I've used this, for example, to read the CPSR value after doing a subtraction to check the negative flag. Um, and if I want to um, check the negative flag of set after doing a subtraction, for whatever reason in assembly, you can do uh, this kind of operation, but instead of using move, you use uh, um, MSR or MRS. Actually, you'd use uh, MRS to read the CPSR value into the register. So that actually, that example is in your examples directory if you want to look at it uh, under projects example in the emulator. So that actually, if you're able to read the CPSR and check if the negative flag has been set. So earlier we saw equals is a write only. Similarly, you can have uh, read only and read write. Um, so plus is uh, read write, I think. I was pretty sure that was a read only. Um, I'll have to get back to you on the read only uh, modifier. But equals uh, plus means uh, read write, and then ampersand is uh, just for output. So these are used, for example, in here, the equals uh, reference is uh, write only, and then um, this one has no modifier. I guess that means read only, so I'll have to double check that. So here's the example uh, I used. So it's actually example six. It's in your examples directory. Uh, so instead of reading the CPSR, uh, I was trying to read the APSR just to see uh, the flag change. And sure enough, um, the APSR actually gets updated. The CPSR, for some reason, in the emulator doesn't get updated. Um, so, so after you run a uh, operation that results in a negative integer, and you read the APSR, you'll see the flag actually change. So the APSR is actually a synonym for the CPSR. So they just made a, ARM just made another level of abstraction for application programmers to be able to read system level, uh, you know, registers and stuff like that. So all right. So now that we've uh, done inline assembly, how do we reference uh, direct assembly code in our C uh, programs? So as you've already seen, we can define um, our assembly function, uh, which you already saw with Fibonacci. Uh, so generally, a lot of these uh, directives are optional. So here, all I'm saying is the syntax is using unified assembly language, which is what the ARMv7 follows. And the reason these come in handy is so that if you're running the same code on older, or uh, if you were to run this on a newer architecture, it would preserve the 
uh, features of the older architecture. And uh, generally, ARM tends to make them backwards compatible, so uh, you'll be able to use the same piece of code. Um, and this also specifies the architecture. Um, and since it's thumb mode, it's always aligned to two bytes. Uh, so these are actually uh, optional because you can specify those with GCC options. Um, and then finally, uh, to declare a function, you say dot global my work. It's a global method. Um, and then you say the type of my work is function. And then you put your code here, and then you end with dot size uh, my work minus dot minus my work. So this actually calculates the size of your method. I'm not really sure why you need it, but um, I found that things don't work if you don't have that. Anymore. And finally, you end the code. Uh, so it starts with dot text and ends with dot end. So this is sort of your text section. Uh, if you remember the arm elf uh, ELF syntax. And finally, to compile your uh, code, you would write gcc-c-o, the object file, followed by the assembly file. And when you want to compile this object with your C code, you would say gcc-o, the binary name, followed by the object files. And uh, as long as uh, in your C code you've referenced an extern int that method with all the argu uh, argument uh, declaration, I guess, the function declaration, uh, you just have to put it as an extern. And when GCC compiles, it will link the two together. Any questions so far?